Welcome to Thomas Jefferson, Then and Now. I'm Catherine Algor, and I'm the president here at the Massachusetts Historical Society, the first historical society in the country. We have a priceless collection of over 14 million items, including two and a half presidential libraries, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. And our mission is to to connect as many people and as many kinds of people to this material in ways that are useful to them. So um, let's get to the program. I don't actually get to introduce Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf, but I'm so honored to pre-introduce them. Uh, we've known each other for years. They are steadfast and wonderful colleagues um, and mentors, and I'm just thrilled to have them here. So um, thanks for your time and talent, Annette and Peter. Gavin, you do the introduction proper. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this evening, we have a program, Thomas Jefferson, Then and Now, with Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf. Uh, tonight's program is a special event uh, for us at MHS. Uh, we hold the personal papers of Thomas Jefferson, as well as a wealth of material related to the American Revolution uh, and the early Republic. So the conversation is really drawing heavily from the strengths of our collection. Uh, but we are also very interested in history being a live conversation that is engaged dialogue and that questions, explores, and reinterprets the manuscripts that we hold. So uh, we're, that makes it exciting for us because just about four years ago, um, we hosted a conversation uh, with Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf to a packed house at MHS uh, back in the heyday of in-person programming where we could actually enjoy uh, our beautiful building. Um, they came uh, to talk about their uh, jointly authored publication, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson, The Empire of the Imagination. Uh, so tonight is really a special treat because it's a continuation of a conversation that started four years ago. Um, I would just like to point out that we are able to make Jefferson's papers available to the public, as well as create a wealth of programs, uh, thanks to the support of our members uh, and donors. So if you are, for some reason, not yet a member of the Massachusetts Historical Society, we hope you will consider uh, visiting our website uh, and becoming a member or a supporter uh, in some form or another. Um, so uh, this evening, we have a really wonderful program. Annette Gordon-Reed is a Carl M. Loeb University professor at Harvard, where she teaches both in history and in the law school. Her books, The Hemingses of Monticello and American Family, won 16 book prizes, including the Pulitzer Prize in History in 2009 and the National Book Award in 2008. Her other works include Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings in American Controversy, Race on Trial, um, Law and Justice in American History, a volume of essays that she edited Andrew Johnson, uh, as well as The Most Blessed of the Patriarchs mentioned earlier. Uh, before teaching at Harvard, she taught at University of Oxford and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. She had been, has been awarded the Guggen Guggenheim Fellowship in the Humanities, a MacArthur Fellowship, uh, the National Humanities Medal, uh, and many more awards. She is, it's worth mentioning, also a trustee of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, Peter Onuf is the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Virginia. He has taught at, or he taught at UVA for more than 20 years. He is the author or editor of 12 books, including Jefferson's Empire, The Language of American Nation Nationhood, uh, and The Mind of Thomas Jefferson. He is considered a leading scholar of Jefferson and the early American Republic and has written extensively on sectionalism, federalism, and, and political economy. He is also a founding member and now host emeritus of the weekly podcast, Backstory. So without further ado, I will invite our panelists to join us um, and uh, begin their conversation. Bye. Good evening. Hey. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Great Good to, to be see here you. again. Great to be here again, uh, virtually at the Massachusetts Historical Society. We look forward to someday being back there to mm. maybe continue a conversation. Uh, Peter, do you want to yeah. start? Yeah. Well, we thought we'd said the last word the last time we were there, <laughs> and uh, why should we ever have to say anything again? Uh, but a lot's happened in the last few years, and I think it's a great opportunity for us to continue our conversation and include 
all you people out there, uh, Thomas Jefferson is a controversial character. And though we thought we had him fixed for good, he's still up for grabs. And this is a strange, strange time to be an historian. Uh, it's a strange time to be anybody, I guess. But we find that the whole idea of history, and particularly of our man Thomas Jefferson, is, is as I suggest, well, a, a site of controversy. Jefferson's uh, not easy to get your mind around. Uh, and the, the big problem is this, and let me put it simply, and I'd like to ask you to maybe kick things off by explaining why it is, even though we wrote the definitive book, people are still unclear about Jefferson and his role in American history, and particularly why, yet again, the question of Jefferson as a slaveholder and his ideas about race have become the center uh, a lightning rod for controversy. And I want to say, this is a hard time to sell Jefferson. Not, not that we are salespersons. Hard time to sell Jefferson. But I'm prepared to say, even though I'm very critical of the man, that we need him and to understand him more than ever. How did we get to the place we are now? In that? Well, it's interesting because we started writing this book when we started writing this book, Jefferson was even then a controversial figure. He has been a controversial figure actually for the time he entered the public stage. But I mean, in, in historiographical terms, right. Jefferson is up and down, up and down over the years. And beginning in the 60s with Leonard Levy, of course, this is the standard story about what happened writing about Jefferson and, and um, civil liberties. And then Conor Cruz O'Brien's famous uh, right. takedown attempt of him in the Atlantic. So he's always, he's been a problematic figure for a, a while. But when we were writing, from the time that we started writing this and the time that we were last at the Massachusetts Historical Society, there's been a sea change in people's understanding about this. Right. It's in the last, not quite a year, the last six or seven months yeah. with the killing of George Floyd that sort of started a national conversation about America and the question of race and America's past. And I had sort of boldly made a prediction a couple of years ago that when we got to this point of tearing down monuments and so forth, that there would be a distinction, that there should be a distinction made between Confederates and members of the founding generation like Jefferson. Uh, I still think that that's true, but not, well, I guess I should say to my surprise how quickly we went from Jeff Davis <laughs> to Thomas Jefferson as a figure who uh, we should be very wary of and a figure whose mm -hmm. statues, memorials and names and so forth should be taken down or taken off of buildings and so forth. Um, and this is just a very, very different moment. And the other, I was, we were talking earlier that in past times when Jefferson was down, uh, people brought him down. It was mainly a conversation among whites. And I would say right. mainly among white historians, male historians who dominated the profession. Now we're in a period where myriad different voices, diverse voices are weighing in on this. And whether they're African-American voices, women, other people of color who have problems with Jefferson because whatever he said in the declaration, there's the other side of Jefferson who was a slaveholder. Um, people are aware of the fact, more people are aware of the fact that he did not think that blacks and whites could live together in peace in the United States of America, that their slavery was wrong, there should be emancipation, but then there should be expatriation. Well, we spent the past, since the civil rights movement, we've been trying to bring the country together. The idea is that we, we take it as a given that the United States is a multicultural, multiracial society. And when we hear someone from the 18th century casting doubt upon that or saying that that's not possible, that's a reason to condemn him. So that general unease about him that has been exacerbated in the past six months is we're trying to do a sort of wholesale new look at race relations in America makes him a problematic figure. 
And so trying to convince people that he is useful in any fashion that we should not just sort of put him into mothballs is a tough, is a tough sell. Well, we've discovered that white supremacy is real. Yes. It's systemic or structural. Choose mm -hmm. your word. Mm -hmm. It's something that you could look away from, mm -hmm. not necessarily being consciously racist, but suggesting, well, this is our history. Yes. Get yes. with it. Mm -hmm. It happened. And here we are now. The problem with white supremacy, though, the idea, the totalizing idea of white supremacy is that it does draw attention to this deep fracture in American society mm -hmm. that becomes its original meaning. Mm -hmm. And so the question really is a fundamental one. And I have felt with Jefferson as these tremors have uh, rippled through our world that maybe it, maybe there's no future for Jefferson. But when I say that, I'm wondering if there's a future for the country. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds somewhat megalomaniac. I'm just a mild-mannered <laughs> historian. Who cares about it? <laughs> but I do think there is something about how we define where we came from mm -hmm. and how we got to be where we are. And I do think that Jefferson is essential to that story. And if a story began with two nations, mm -hmm. and you're exactly right, Jefferson doesn't meet our contemporary standard because he imagined enslaved people as a captive nation mm -hmm. held in a kind of a cold war, a permanent, chronic cold war held in chains in order to maintain a peace that would sustain white society. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, when you discover this for the first time, I think many of our students do, many of our colleagues do, when they first read about the problem of race at the founding and how it's there from the beginning, it's very unsettling. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's 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 the challenge is, is to take that on, not to deny it. So we are not here to deny that Jefferson said awful things and by our standards lived a life. He performed mastery. He was part of the problem as we now see it of the founding. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it goes back to the question that I raised before about differentiating, say, the Confederates from the founders. It raises the question, you know, well, how do we have a story? How do we have a common story if we don't think about where we began? And we began in very different places. White males began in very different places from an African-American female, the typical African-American female who would have been enslaved during that time period. And this is the challenge to try to have a past, have a common past that we can look to and sort of talk right. about ourselves in a realistic fashion. You know, it's not enough to sort of X out the things in the past that causes problems uh, I differentiate the I sort of put the Confederates in one box because over a line, because I like to think that their values are not the values that we continue to hold. This was uh, the metaphor mm -hmm. I use is like a river. They're sort of a branch that went off into a swamp. We're not really there anymore. But mm -hmm. the declaration, the ideas of the founding, whether we think that they were perfect or not in executing that we still believe in the Declaration of Independence as a creed, a, a principle, a form of, of a, a guidepost for us. And so leave, relieving, you know, relieving ourselves of the, uh, the trauma of whatever you want to call it, of dealing with the reality of some feelings that, and thoughts that are anathema to us um, is not good enough. We need to have some way of looking at the past that sees these people not as our best friends, not as people that we want to live with or whatever, but people who did things that helped make us who we are and things that we still, I like to think we still aspire to. Yeah, I think that's really important. And the word we keeps coming up, our history. And here's the paradox for us. Our history began when we didn't include all of us, mm -hmm. but it became all of us. 
Now, it's getting a little confusing, but let's just take the principles of the Declaration that you pointed to, and I think they're really important. And they, you might say the idea of a people is a radical abstraction. Mm-hmm. What is a people? Right now, we're having trouble recognizing recognizing each other as constituting yes. a people. So this, it, it shouldn't be uh, surprising that it's a problem. In a way, we see the, the revolutionary period in this dire way. We emphasize these divisions because we're projecting our divisions onto that period. And there's a kind of a hopelessness to that. But if you take the idea of we as a project, and that's a favorite word of the Enlightenment. They had projects, they did things, they improved things. And to create a republic, and that's the radical thing that brings a new idea of who we are to the fore, it's a we that's based on consent. It's a we that is protean, that is, it's the beginning of something. It is, I'd like to say, it's an aspiration. Yes, we keep talking about the promises of the Declaration and of the founding, and are they fulfilled? Well, the Declaration itself is a prayer or a hope, and it's based or a radical experiment. It's a word often used that is, let's try this out in the middle of a war against the greatest power on earth, when what we're trying out is uh, mounting armed force, mobilizing a people, telling people they're not subjects of King George and and, uh, the third anymore, but they are Americans, whatever that is, a neologism. Who are these Americans? Well, it's a radical idea. And I think that's the crucial thing. Think of Jefferson and the Declaration as being a script for mobilization Mm -hmm. that Jefferson provides. He, he didn't invent America, sorry, Gary Wills, but he <laughs> did provide a script that people could read from, that they could repeat, mm-hmm. that they could recognize each other in the words they were articulating together, mm-hmm. that notion of simultaneity all over what they called the continent Americans were declaring this thing, and in the very declaring of it, they became American. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. of course there was not, this was not an inclusive republic. It's the idea of a republic that we need to recall now because that's precisely what we're trying to sustain at this moment. Yes. A and, republic. Yeah. Yes. And people, even people who were immediately outside of that saw something in that. African-Americans who were free and who had an opportunity to participate, look to the declaration, look to those words, as a project, as an idea that this yeah, is something yeah. that should be fulfilled. And we have and we know we're historians, we don't like to talk about inevitability, we don't like to talk about the march of progress, but this is what happened. <laughs> it's not to say that they envision this happening, but this is what happened. People, every group that wants to make a place for itself in the United States looks to that document, to, those, to that idea as the basis for their claim to right. being a part of we, the people. And it's, ta- it's been a struggle. And the, one of the weird things about this particular moment, being a historian of the early American Republic, is to look at where we are now and to the realization that apparently a good number of our fellow citizens don't really believe in that idea. Um, don't believe in that, these notions. And uh, it's disheartening because on one hand, I, I like to see myself as a realist. I said, well, of course, you know, this, this is something that could happen. As a historian, I know anything, you know, could happen in the march of time, but it's been slightly disappointing, uh, slightly disappointing to find out that so many people don't believe that? Am I being too cynical? Oh, yeah. Come on. I, I have to be the optimist. You're forcing me okay. into this really uncharacteristic position. Uh, I, I think the thing that you're feeling right now is that we're channeling the nausea, the anxiety, the sense of dislocation and alienation that so many people, white, black, Native American, felt 
at the moment of regime change, now we can focus regime change, at least in our minds right now, to maybe one or two days next week. But the regime change that was taking place in British America was sustained, you could argue, for a quarter century or more, this experiment, as I put it. But what sustained people were two things. One, a set of ideas, ideas that were in their time and place radical. That is that society and politics did not have to be organized hierarchically, a social order from top to bottom. You don't need a king. Yep. We have the capacity among those people who commit themselves to the common cause. Every person contributes the mobilization. And that's not just white people. We know that that uh, the founding and in some ways the Constitution is much more at the center of the racializing of the early American Republic mm -hmm. and the perpetuation of slavery. Those promises, those ideas, and declaration, as I suggested, are fruity and they're open. The thing that's important are those ideas have lasting value and resonance. And that's what you're despairing, that maybe we're forgetting about them. Now, maybe some of our country men are, and women are forgetting about them. But those ideas that we associate with natural rights, mm -hmm. with self-evident truths, those are a, a powerful core for mobilization. And that's the point I want to make. It's mobilization. It's Citizens coming together, recognizing each other as fellow citizens, making war when they have to. It's a crucial thing. This is an existential threat to the lives of these people, to their world. And it was a moment when boundaries did open, mm -hmm. when free people in New England, particularly Rhode Island and elsewhere, eventually were recruited by a slave owner from Virginia into the Continental Army. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an opening up. And a shutting down. But the crucial thing is the act of mobilization. Think mm -hmm. of what the founders and revolutionaries did is to craft a toolkit, a technology, if you want to use a pompous word, <laughs> through which, yeah, I do often do that, uh, through which uh, they could affect change. Mm -hmm. That has been, the, I think, the core of massive disillusionment for many Americans over the last half century. Mm -hmm. And that is the feeling that of oh, that the, the, the politics is not us, that we're not connected, that we have uh, no role in this world. And then we discover that people are using the tools of democracy for what we take to be anti-democratic ends. Mm -hmm. And it's deeply disappointing, yet it's also, and this is, I just want to, bring to the fore. You're too young to remember this. Event. But we used to talk dialectics all the time in the 1960s. Man, it's darkness before the dawn. I can't wait for tomorrow. <laughs> Things are going to get better. Uh, well, you set, up, you set yourself up for disappointment when tomorrow turns out to be <laughs> worse. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're not going forward. So, but what I I think we're recalling now. I think historians, American historians, feel they have an important role to play. They have, they have something to testify to to our history, not a sugar-coated history, not airbrushed, but the real story is an inspiring story if you will allow yourself to be inspired. And that's that's been that disenchantment of the last couple of generations is that loss of uh, the magic, the faith, mm -hmm. the belief in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the things that okay, so I I will I will calm down. I Does mean, that there help? are that it helps. It helps. <laughs> um, there are signs of hope. This word mobilization that you used, what has happened over the past few months not just in this country, but around the world, mobilizing against notions of white supremacy, mobilizing against inequality. Uh, people are coming together to, to do things, uh, voting. I mean, I just was telling you, Peter, that I had the experience of spending four and a half hours in line for early voting here in New York City, which isn't That's even a swing state. Signaling. 
in that. For four what? and a half hours, you're virtue signaling. I'm virtually signaling, yes. Well, hey, I did it. I might as well talk about it. And this isn't even a swing state. I mean, people are mobilized on both sides. People are mobilized. And that's what the declaration, that's what that moment, the founding moment is supposed to be about, is getting rid of a monarchy, getting rid of a system where people did not have the right to to govern themselves um, and would mobilize for the purposes of changing that regime, mobilize to create a republic and presumably mobilize to keep that republic over time. All of the things that I'm talking about, not perfect in the beginning, but nowhere near perfect, it's, that's not even a word to think about, but over time, groups of American citizens mobilizing to make their place in American society. And that's, that process is continuing. I think that what I suppose what's disheartening is the idea that voting in, in a republic, in a democratic republic, that voting would be seen as a threat <laughs> to, to certain people, that, you know, to certain groups of people who think that voting is a threat in a democratic republic. How, how could, what is that about? And that goes back to, this is back to Jefferson, it goes back to Jefferson, the question of race, the question of African-Americans place as citizens in the country that's always, for some people, has always been dicey. People have wanted to claim a past. And I think really that's at the core of a lot of originalism. Let's go back to the time when mm -hmm. Blacks were not really a part of this. We had a different type of republic that was based upon the notion of white, of propertyed white male suffrage or whatever. That was the go sort of the golden age, a putative golden age. Um, so Jefferson, in some of the things that he'd written about in notes on the state of Virginia, uh, about you know suspicion only that blacks were mentally inferior. Mm -hmm. uh, the separation of the races after, emanci after emancipation, all those kinds of things, you know, that's a, he didn't invent those things either. He didn't invent the ideas in the declaration. He no. didn't invent that as well, but that's a source of unease about, about him as, as a figure that we should, that we should be paying attention to. The difficulty mm -hmm. is that he was a part of so much of American, early American life. Uh, I was reading, I was talking to somebody the other day who's writing something that didn't really have anything to do specifically with politics in the early American Republic. And this person was saying that Jefferson is all over everything, you know, and you don't really have a figure like that. You can't really just put in a corner <laughs> or pretend that they didn't exist or, you know, it's just, it's impossible. It's to my mind, it's an actually, it's a, an important exercise to deal with someone, that difficult kind of person who has good things and bad things, but has so much, you know, and I, and I of course, I would say that because I'm, I'm a Jefferson scholar, but I still think it's important for Americans in general to separate out this notion that an important figure in history has to be somebody that we love or something right. that we like or because what do you, what kind of past is that where you're just recognizing only the people and you're not going to have them because I guarantee you almost anybody, one of the things about the past and people in the past is one who you don't like biographies, but I've read no. lots and lots of biographies and there's no era where you can't find somebody find things about a person that would be disqualifying, um, you know, yeah. if, you, if you dealt with it. So if you dealt with that and if you made it as a standard that a figure that you have to pay attention to or commemorate in some fashion has to be somebody who, who we think is all around great person. Well, and that I've always suspected that you were a little soft on Jefferson. Uh, I, I, You've become I mean, much softer than I. I mean, well, you... this I'm I'm aging. Uh, this is uh, I don't know second childhood or something. But uh, uh, I have always been deeply conflicted about Jefferson. That I, that's sort of a joke with me. But it it means that 
if you fall into one side or the other, love or hate, you're not going to get him right. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the balance that you and I have tried to, to reach, is to try oh, to get yeah. a fix on him. And when you do that, though, I think there are things that you can pull away. It's not just that we have to hold our nose and say, well, he's there. Uh-huh. And so the past stinks. Well, we know that. Mm-hmm. Uh well, the present stinks, actually, too, I'd like to just say. And so I, <laughs> I pity the poor historians of 50 years from now uh, having to deal with us, of all people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I want to briefly get back to that idea of mobilization and suggest a, 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 a big way of thinking about it. Even while Jefferson and his fellow revolutionaries were mobilizing, and they did recruit some Native Americans, they did recruit some African Americans and free people, uh, though many uh, enslaved people escaped the British lines and constituted a counter-revolutionary mobilization. Mm-hmm. There was an Indian country. Think about the multiplicity of mobilizations. And of course, that's a fancy way of talking about a state of war. Mm-hmm. What is the United States at its best? What does it aspire to do? It is a peace plan. It takes the existence of people with ambitions, with pursuits, with needs, with enterprises who are going to form associations with each other. They're going to mobilize. That's a given. Can they do that peacefully? Can there be a civic framework for mobilizations? And the struggle for groups that have been marginalized, oppressed, enslaved to mobilize for inclusion, that's a vital part of the larger progress. And the, but the idea of citizen action is an idea that's an American idea. It grows out of the commitments Jefferson and his fellow patriots made to each other. And it's a model for, as I said before, a technology that other peoples will use. Can that peace be sustained? Well, the original question would be asked by most white Americans in the early years was, could the states stay together? Could these Mm -hmm. distinct places with distinct ways of life, some heavily invested in the institution of slavery? Mm -hmm. This is the ugly thing about early American history. You can't even have a union. You can't have the United States of America without accommodating accommodating slave societies. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's just, you have to get over that. That is the truth. That doesn't make the idea of union invalid. It doesn't make the aspiration for peace among the states. And then a more expansive peace that would include peoples who had been denied their full, proper recognition and standing in the nation. So I think that broader perspective, if we talk about this, and Jefferson is, as we keep telling people, he's dead. He's gone. <laughs> Leave him alone as a human being. He's gone. He's dead. What we need to talk about, though, is how does our experience connect to and how is to the past and how is that proof past crucial to us in our dilemma today? Yeah. And I think that Jefferson, with all the problems we've seen, it's precisely because of those problems that he had to believe in progress. He had to believe that someday these things would be worked out. His solution to the institution of the slavery problem is not one that's acceptable to us. Mm-hmm. And it was in, in the end, in his personally, as I've said a million times, it wasn't even acceptable to him when he frees yes. people. He doesn't say, now you got to go to Liberia. I mean, there, there's so much you really get the sense of how uh, he had no idea what to do about slavery. I mean, no real, I mean, just no idea about it. I mean, the only thing we don't like to talk about inevitability, but we kind of hard, it's hard to think of how slavery could have ended other than it ended in, in a fight. And yeah. that's not something yeah. he would have said, this is what we're going to do. Right. Uh, because that's not, that was not going to be in the cards. But I mean, in thinking about how young people and how people should think about him today, I get letters all the time from people asking me, you know, I'm at Thomas Jefferson Junior High School. I'm at Thomas Jefferson, blah, 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 blah. Should we change the name 
of this school? What should we do? And it's fascinating because as you well know, in 1789, he writes this famous letter to James Madison and he talks about the earth belongs to yeah. the living. He talks about the generation, generations of people who you know, will have their own way of going and doing things. And he also believed when you, this came to me when you were talking about um, his belief in progress. Yeah. When he says things are going to work out with slavery, those kinds of things. We look at that because we, it's kind of not clear that we actually continue to believe in, in progress and we see it as a dodge, but he actually believed that. Yeah. I mean, he actually thought that people would get smarter and better as time went on. Now we know that's not true, but he had that kind of faith, a sort of an enlightenment faith in the world as akin to science scientific right. knowledge, things we find out and we do things in a better way. And we kind of know that that's not necessarily true, that science doesn't always bring good things. It what brings good things, but it brings bad things as well. Um, and it's difficult, I think, for 20th and 21st century people to wrap our minds around an 18th century mind like that, like his, um, who had seen things change and thought that this would continue. He, had, he and his compatriots had defeated the most powerful nation on earth. Maybe France would probably make quarrel with that, but they had done away with monarchy. It would be the equivalent of, you know, get away of communism or whatever. We've done away with monarchy. Anything could happen. And it that good things would happen as time went on. And we just, I don't know that we believe that as fervently as he did. And it makes him seem a kind of naive figure in a well, way, I, unbelievable I he, figure. Yeah, uh, I think you have to say it was a faith uh, that he had in the people. And we could say glibly, well, the people just didn't live up to it. But I think it's more than that. It, it does have to do with, it touches on what he takes to be fundamental impulses. That is the concern for, um, for the children, for the younger generation. You brought up that great letter to Madison. That belief that there is something beyond you in the rising generations, that idea if you look forward with Jefferson, particularly from his inaugural address, when he's talking about uh, land enough for the thousands to the thousands generation in this vast mm -hmm. continent, of course, it wasn't an empty continent. No, and we ran out of land, and besides, California is burning up anyway, so it's uh, <laughs> all have to go to sea eventually to stay away from the fires. But uh, that idea of infinite possibility. Uh, it seems so naive. You're right to say that. On the other hand, it's it's against the reality of entrenched institutions of the of well human frailties. Everything in ample evidence. Late 18th century white Americans smelled bad. They were violent. They practiced corporal punishment. They were cruel, nasty, vulgar dirty, smelly people, but they thought things could be better. And how would they come become better? I think that's the question that we're asking. Mm -hmm. And it has something to do with what you might call a civic culture, a political civic culture that is the, the customs and the habits to invoke Tocqueville of a democratic people uh, who, uh, well, it's a strange new beast for Tocqueville writing in ja about Jacksonian democracy, and we're a strange new beast. What kind of culture can sustain the practices of self-governance? Mm -hmm. These are profound questions. They're not easily answered, and probably the biggest problem for modern Americans has been a sense of complacency about mm -hmm. how totally, absolutely dead and wonderful we are. Yes, yes. And we're not. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and we're not in the face of existential challenges as great as the world turned upside down in revolutionary America, the revolutionary world in the Atlantic 
from the late 18th into the 19th century, nobody could take anything for granted. Then we can't now. What are our choices in a way? Jefferson frames his faith in the future in very positive terms. He imagines us being who, who, who he couldn't be, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, who he might aspire to be. He uh-huh. knew we would know more. He knew that science would, would unlock many of the mysteries of nature, the laws of nature. Well, we've got our challenges. We're different. Yeah. Uh, but they are equivalent challenges. And I think the question of faith, and one of the problems with the, uh, the separation of church and faith, uh, church and state, church and faith, and faith is that uh, church and state is that we imagine that faith is a private thing, only of personal transcendent concern, mm-hmm. where a, a community dedicated to the, its perpetuation, to the well-being of children, time out of mind into the future, that has to be motivated by a kind of faith. And I think that's what we can honor in Jefferson for all his failings and our manifest, as they're everybody at that time. Mm-hmm. But that that belief, it's a belief in continuity. It's the reverse of, of what we as historians think is important. That story mm-hmm. that we that we understand in reverse looking back. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think we have a role as custodians of the stories, of the true stories, not lies, not myths, not fables, the true stories that will provide a roadmap into the future. Mm-hmm. It's a strange world. It's not Jefferson's world. But we can understand his humanity. Just as you restored the humanity of the Hemingses so brilliantly in, 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 in your book, it's... That's what we need to do collectively is to understand the humanity of all those people. And this story that we're living now and will unfold before us is one that we can shape. Mm -hmm. We can't shape it if we don't believe in each other. Exactly. And if we don't believe that we have a past, that we shared a past. Yeah. uh, So support the Massachusetts Historical Society. Society. Yes. Gavin. Gavin. Uh, on that note, I know that you guys were interested in taking a, a number of questions from the audience. So um, it's a fascinating conversation. I, I have the feeling that you could uh, probably go back and forth for, for quite some time. <laughs> well, why, you know, why not? Come on, Gavin. <laughs> I, I would love it. Um, <laughs> uh, but when we were planning, it was actually you guys <laughs> to take questions from the audience. Um, but we do have uh, some good ones that have been been coming in uh, that we've been monitoring. Um, so I think it's probably best to start with one from the opposite end of the country. Um, a person named Eric in Oregon uh, wrote, uh, I teach citizenship, citizenship classes to immigrants. Based on today's understanding, what are the most salient facts about Jefferson I should share with my students? Hmm. About immigration? <laughs> well, you could start off with, with, uh, with the fact that uh, Jefferson well, it took various positions. Uh, he was not uh, keen on immigrants. If he thought they came from monarchical cultures and would bring their bad habits with them, uh, but he changed his mind in the wake of the French Revolution, and uh, then he was in favor of a, of a very liberal, generous uh, system of, of naturalization. Uh, and there was a self-interested reason. We, I talked about mobilization. Well, his they voted Jefferson, for him. <laughs> That's it. Uh, and that is that ultimately we have that value as human beings that we're, we, uh, in America, we can be voters. So uh, I, I'd start with that. that. That's the nuts and bolts. The larger picture has to do with, uh, uh, I think, the, the openness uh, to, to, uh, to immigrants, particularly people who want to come here in some ways, get why it's important to be here. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Jefferson understood that. That that was the thing about immigrants. They were motivated. Uh, We said uh, motivated for the good of their families, but motivated to breathe the free air, to use that uh, 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 tired metaphor. It doesn't seem so free anymore. But anyway, it's... uh, Annette, would you... uh, Yeah, I I would say that. And of course, the Declaration, 
and mm -hmm. to do the thing that people call the paradox. We're trying to move away from using that word, but uh, certainly the declaration, all men are created equal. And then at the same time that he's the slave owner, sort of presenting the sort of American dilemma at the beginning of the founding, that's important to try to understand how, um, how he negotiated sure. yeah. that or did not negotiate that. Uh, a complex, the, the most important thing is to think of him as a complex figure, a person who uh, wanted to make a mark in the world, started out as a very young person deciding that he wanted, that that's what he was going to do. And he did it in a pretty spectacular fashion. So uh, I would, about him personally, to think of someone of, uh, of tremendous will and skill and complications, yep. <laughs> complex person. It's always difficult when you're uh, faced with having very few very few pages to share with a person when they have to learn something uh, very yeah, quickly. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Summarizing becomes very difficult, <laughs> uh, especially when a person is so complex. But um, speaking of Jefferson uh, as a young person, um, it sort of relates to a question uh, that was sent in by Barney. Um, it says, uh, as historical research proves that our previous heroes were in fact flawed human beings, uh, do children still need the idea of heroes? Annette, you became interested in Jefferson you were, when you were still uh, in elementary school. Uh, what was that like for you? Well, um, at the time, I didn't realize how complicated he was. It was just much more, <laughs> it was much more of a point. Of, like, this person, you're telling me he wrote the Declaration of Independence and he was a slave owner. What is up with that? Um, I think it was it was an occasion for me to think about, I keep coming back to this word, life is not simple and people aren't simple. I think that was the basic takeaway for me that someone, in particular someone who did all the things that he did was gonna be somebody who had a very interesting mind. And so that's, it was curiosity. It was not, it's not a feeling of, love or hate or whatever or disdain it was really curiosity who who is this person and that's that works very well i mean for a historian if you could put it in the terms of of a subject a subject or events or so forth but for a biographer it's critical uh, to be interested in in the person uh, i would say that jefferson uh, himself told us that we should not worship great men mm -hmm. uh, that's a problem uh, and I think he was right. And he's not alone in saying this. Uh, he claims he didn't really write the Declaration of Independence, and he's right about that. Those weren't his ideas. Uh, he was a wordsmith. You know, we honor people who can put words together. That's great. Uh, but the revolution was a people's movement. And I think what we lose sight of when we tell our story in terms of great men, emphasizing gender, is that we miss the complexity. Uh, we, we miss the roles that a whole population plays. Sometimes uh, unclear of what they're doing in the fog of the moment. Uh, yet if the revolution, the revolution's success depended fundamentally on what ordinary people did. Oh. And that, that is something, how do you teach that? Well, I think that's the heart of, 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 a, of a civics pedagogy. We don't mm -hmm. do civics anymore, though. Mm -hmm. History's default is sort of a 19th century romantic idea of great nations and great men. Mm -hmm. uh, the presidential census, the, the dynasties, uh, memorize all this stuff, and you've got it. Deeply boring. It's not true. And all it does is lead to demystification. And oh, God, they're not great at all. Damn it. So I, I say, down with great men. We down got with our great men. I'm out of here. I, I, up with complicated, uh, useful people. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, certainly with all the discussion of monuments and, and markers today, this is. is just really brings up the point. I mean, do you ever want to cast something in bronze? It's unmovable. Um, I guess nothing is unmovable, but do you want to 
There's, is there anyone who's worth formalizing that way? Or are you just going down a path to disappointment at some point? Well, you know, I, I think it depends on how we sell it. You know, nobody has to look at a statue and say, this is a god. You know, I mean, I think it's perfectly within our capability to teach young people the value of commemoration, but not adoration. Um, I could look at a statue of King. I could look at a statue of Jefferson. I could look at a statue of, you know, other people, again, and, and that proviso that these are people who have to have values that we still aspire to um, mm -hmm. and have a realistic vision of them. It doesn't have to be a 19th century, we're not in the 19th century anymore. We don't have to think of them in that particular way. The thing is to have people look at a statue of Jefferson and say, oh, the author of draftsman of the Declaration of Independence, but he owned slaves. He had these, if the people have all the information, if they have all the information, they can recognize the importance of a person without thinking that that has to come with affection or come with adoration, which is just not, it's just a recipe for people. Yeah. You're always going to disappoint, you know? If you could deal with that complexity in an historical figure, and you, of course, you need to populate your story with real people doing real things. Mm -hmm. You understand their complexity, you engage with that, and you don't say, I'm for him, I'm against him, but you get into that moment of what that person is doing. That is the threshold of civic understanding. Mm -hmm. It, it translates it, from history into the present moment. Exactly. I mean, that's and that's the important point. If you can understand that kind of complexity about a person in the past, I think it helps today. It helps the way you view political figures today, social figures, whatever, the way you attack problems. That there is no binary. There is no, you know, you you love it or you hate it. That that's not that's not really the inquiry. It's 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 something deeper than that. Oh, we can sort of flip that completely on its side uh, for a question from Jessica, <laughs> who says, rather than uh, uh, essentially historical understanding, uh, helping us understand uh, today, um, she said, here's something I've been thinking about. Uh, and I wonder what you think. What might Jefferson have done if he was uh, around in 1860, reluctant Confederate? And what might be his perspective today not so much um, who would he vote for, but what principles do you think he would uh, particularly bring to bear on this moment? That's tough. We might have, well. Now, I'll start with 1860 and then you can, you can do, uh, you can channel him for right now. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it should be understood that Jefferson was not a hero among Confederates. And it's precisely because of the Declaration of Independence because he never, despite the fact he didn't do anything about slavery, uh, the, he did not become a pro-slavery ideologue. He did not romanticize or sentimentalize his relationship with his slaves. He always understood intellectually it was unjust, radically unjust. Uh, in many ways, uh, Jefferson's reputation on the eve of the Civil War is uh, was on, uh, he was a bad guy from both sides in yeah. many ways. It, it was up to Lincoln to find in Jefferson the bright line that could be extended into the future, and that is uh, in, in the notion of natural rights, that the revolution wasn't just a taxpayer's revolt, it wasn't just uh, planters wanting to protect their slave property. It had something to do with, with these transcendent values, ones that we honor, natural rights. Uh, that's incredible, but that was not the majority opinion. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Lincoln himself, coming from a Whig background, was not, not raised to love Jefferson. <laughs> but he came to see in Jefferson in a way. If emulate Abraham Lincoln, then you get Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, 1860, it would have it would have been wrenching for him to have Virginia uh, in opposition mm -hmm. to the Union. I mean, that would have been a tough thing for him. He would have hated 
the idea of the South going to Great Britain for help or thinking about that. That that was what the whole revolution was supposed to have been about is to move, you know, to move America, the United States out of European balance of power politics. It just, so I don't, I mean, it would have been, I I have no, no firm answer (laughs) about that because it, everything it would have been between a rock and a hard place. It's just okay, you know, thing. what would be his platform today? That's your response. The, my platform today, I think, you know, actually, I'm almost ashamed to admit this. I was thinking about this just the other day. Uh, <laughs> walking down the street, <laughs> thinking about, see, we, we think about it in terms of, it comes to our mind what he would have thought about the politics of today. Mm-hmm. But my goodness, trucks carrying goods, across the nation, trains, cranes, the whatever problem he would have had with black participants. Yes, yes, please. If this country was <laughs> able to produce that, I think he would have thought this was fantastic. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think he would have thought it was fantastic. I mean, the, the convenience, all this, com- the little mechanical engineer in him would have loved, I mean, all of this stuff, would have amazed him that we had achieved that. Um, sure, he would have bought this, the Barack Obama, that would have been weird. What he would have thought would have been even weirder would be Hillary Clinton. I think mean, that probably would have bothered him more. But if you think about the, the totality of the society, we always want to bring him back to talk about this one thing. But the totality of it, I think he would have been enormously... I, mean, I don't know about the current political situation with the voting, this notion of, yeah. you know, of not vo- no, no I, minority vote. I mean, the electoral college where millions of people voted more for one candidate than the other and they don't, their will doesn't prevail. He would not have liked that. Uh, I, I think he would have thought that there is an enormous civic deficit. Uh, everything else you say is right. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it is a fulfillment of enlightenment fantasies in many ways, uh-huh. in, in many ways, but it's uh, it's without the the core, uh-huh. the civic humanist core of republicanism. Uh, that's that's missing. Is that something that can be revived? Is that just nostalgia, or uh, is that essential? Yeah. That's up yeah. to you, voters. Vote for he, me. He, I think he would probably would have been a little concerned too about religious fundamentalism, I mean, yep. given his views on religion, I think he would have been, first place he would have been shocked because he would have thought that that was, you know, wh- whatever we think about religion, I'm not personally, I'm speaking, I'm channeling Jefferson here. I mean, he would have looked at that as though, what's going on with this? I thought well, we were done with that, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know. And how about the Unitarians in Charlottesville changing the name of their church? It's no longer the Thomas Jefferson Unitarian Church. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, they didn't let me testify. I was gonna gonna help them on that, but yeah, I pretty one sure. One last and I have no authority there. <laughs> short sighted, I think. Fair enough. Um, and of course, uh, it's interesting to think about the uh, current election, but also uh, Jefferson's uh, election against Adams, which was also sure. very contentious uh, and was arguably the first transfer of power between two parties that was peaceful. Um, And now at this moment, we're facing at least the theoretical concept of there not being a peaceful transfer for a power. So there's not really a question. It's just (laughs) (laughs) an observation. Good observation. Absolutely. Uh Uh, I think we are much closer in 1801, 1800 uh, to a collapse of the union Uh and, and uh, conditions of a state of war, state of nature. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that there would be a uh, mass violence, but there would have been, uh, could have been catastrophic, permanent mm-hmm. changes. There's well, nothing, nothing. Ready. Yeah. Um, so Jim asked, uh, I'm curious to hear your reactions to the notion of patriotic history, in quotes, uh, and the possibilities of the current election making such a notion more common. How do you think Jefferson would respond to the idea of patriotic history? Well, we've already had some version of patriotic history. (laughs) I mean, uh, uh, history ought to be just history. 
you know, it, it's, it's <laughs> patriotic no. history, patriotic <laughs> history. I mean, you're depends on what that means. I think it's patriotic to be critical of a country. Yeah. I think it's patriotic to tell the truth. So if patriotic history means back to great man history, they were all gods and blah, 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 blah. Mm. No, absolutely not. But I, I think it's patriotic to tell. I, I think it's it shows real love. If you love someone, you love your children, you don't think that every single thing they do is right. You don't tell them that every single thing they do is right. That's the that's not real love. That's cowardice. And, um, you know, I, I feel the same way about the country. I Well, James Baldwin said, you know, I look, I'm paraphrasing him, but he loves America so much that he can criticize it. And yeah. that's that's uh, part of it for me. I think Jim's question is excellent. And, and I would say over the last few years that uh, many um, revisionist historians who imagine themselves as uh, deep critics um, of America have found themselves rallying around the Constitution of all things, around the notion that we are a people. Uh, if patriotism, Jim, simply means uh, that you recognize that there is such a thing as a people and there is a public good, a common project, to use that word again, um, and you don't exclude anybody from that. Uh, so patriotism and a commitment to your country is necessarily a difficult and complicated thing because bad stuff is happening all the time. Uh, but can you sustain that faith that you'll get it one day, maybe the next election? Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're coming sort of to an end of, of the time that we have. So I want to give you guys both a, a chance to just share uh, one last thought if you have it. But we also did have one uh, final question, um, which was essentially, and I'm sort of paraphrasing, but um, was uh, a question about... Uh, a review of the historiography around Jefferson and when there was a shift from him being seen as a hero to being more problematic, like when that started, um, or was there in his own lifetime um, more criticisms of him and did it sort of peak in valley, essentially? It peaked in valley. The very first biography of him uh, begins the introduction in, introduces him as a controversial figure. He's basically saying, I know he is a controversial figure and blah, 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 blah. What had, ha what had happened was when he died, his family released letters um, that had been heretofore private and about the political scene during the 1800s, 1790s. And it ticked a lot of people off. It made you know, there had been a groundswell of, of support for him when he died and it was sad and he and Adams died on the same day and all that. Um, so that began a period of up and down. And as Peter alluded to, you know, the Civil War, he was a controversial figure. He really begins to follow. He, he becomes a great hero again with FDR. And when he who builds the memorial and puts him on the nickel and all of this. And then it begins to the little cracks, as I said before, Leonard Levy writing about Jefferson and civil liberties. Um, Winthrop Jordan's White Over Black, his chapter, and he talks about Sally Hemings in a sort of even-handed way. Um, Fawn Brody's book, and then Connor Cruz O'Brien, his book, The Long Affair, and the more probably the Atlantic Monthly article that has a picture of Jefferson's pedestal being knocked, him being bust of Jefferson being knocked off a pedestal. So, it's it's a late 20th century uh, mm -hmm. turn uh, on him. And uh, yeah. That's it's a good, a good metric of the, testing what really matters to any given generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what we see now, it's a confused terrain. It's not simple. And we thought we had resolved it, as we said. Yeah, I know. Uh, but uh, how how much do you read Jefferson in terms of uh, slave society and his commitment to the institution uh, and this deeply critical account of the empire of slavery, which is what the United States became. And that, that is a, 
an interpretation that has some legs, that has some support in the academy, mm -hmm. um, where Jefferson still gets good marks, uh, notwithstanding race and slavery, is from historians like John Beecham, who will be visiting you shortly, mm -hmm. who, uh, who uh, gets the warts, but believes that uh, the secret to Jefferson is to understand his relationship with power. Uh, and not in a negative sense. Uh, that is, he's not the minimalist, uh, rights-crazed libertarian. Uh, he's a man who who got understood the big problems having to deal with uh, collective security and the state and so forth. So, uh, democracy is. Uh, uh, I think Jefferson will get better marks in the future if uh, there is something resembling a revival of a of a robust. Uh, civic culture engaged in politics, not evading politics. Mm -hmm. I think campaign reform is absolutely crucial to that because that's what alienates us most of all. Uh, I'm not going to editorialize about all that. Uh, he's up for grabs in the future as he is at this very moment. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think uh, as he's up for grabs, our future is up for grabs. And I absolutely. think a sense of our history is is, is critical. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. Just to end, I I think he's up, he's up for grabs now, but to the extent that we can revive a sense of civic participation and the importance of dem democracy, um, democratic republic, fighting for the republic, I think that he will be an important figure. Well, I, I could listen to both of you uh, for the rest of the night. <laughs> You guys are, are All right. Thank you very much uh, uh, for joining us. And Catherine, if you'd like to say a goodbye. I would like to say goodbye and to thank you both. I think as we're heading into the next five or so days, you've given us a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. And if we were still doing statues, we would do statues to you. <laughs> now that's good. That's good Historians idea. Historians deserve a lot more respect. <laughs> that's right. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, and of course, uh, if you'd like to hear more, feel free to join MHS and we'd be happy to keep you in the loop.